Young, P. Ivan Young grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, where he studied with the late James Dickey at the University of South Carolina and where he received his MFA. He's the author of A Shape in the Waves and a recipient of the 2011 Individual Artist Award from the Maryland State Arts Council. His manuscript, Smell of Salt, Ghost of Rain, won second place in the National Federation of State Poetry Society's Stevens Con Contest and was a semifinalist in both the 2013 Fresno State Philip Levine Prize and the 2012 Wayweiser Press Anthony Hecht Poetry Book Contest. His most recent publications are in The Myrrh, Mothwig, Smoke Erotic Poems, and in 14 Hills, Little Patuxet Review, Zone 3, The James Dickey Review, The Cortland Review, and The Crab Orchard Review. He teaches at Salisbury University in Maryland, where he lives with his wife and two children. Sounded kind of like a death sentence where he lives with his wife and two children. And sometimes it feels like that, yes. <clears throat> um, I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, so I don't feel comfortable until I say thank you all for coming here. Um, this is my book, Shape in the Waves. I'm not going to be reading from this tonight because I wanted to do something that was more uh, geared toward nonfiction, but it is available in the back if you're interested. Uh, I've been scuba diving since I was 15, and um, this has a lot of scuba diving poems in it if anyone's interested. But the poems I'm going to be reading from tonight, and I always feel odd at a nonfiction series reading poetry, um, but I guess I'm, I'm comforted a bit. If any of you have seen uh, Pat Conroy's movie, uh, he wrote the novel of the movie The Great Santini, and there's a character in there named Toomer, and he describes quite eloquently one night the night sky, and his friend says, Toomer, you are a poet. And Toomer says, shoot, ain't every natural born liar? And we are natural born liars, whether we're nonfiction, fiction writers or poets. So um, I feel more comfortable in that case reading these poems, but these are poems that are based in my life. They're poems that um, I grew up and my, my first home when I was, a, and this was before I can even remember, my, my mom lived in the projects in South Carolina. And then we kind of worked our way up through the lower class and the lower middle class. And eventually my mom did, when I was a, a teenager, buy her first house. And it was a huge deal for her to move out into the suburbs. But these are poems about the kids I grew up with in a series of apartment complexes I lived in when I was a child. And... Um, it's funny because the, the main, most of these poems are set in one particular complex and the guys that lived in the complex that later became my friends said that I walked into that complex going, oh, hi, how are you doing? And then as soon as I walked across the line of the apartment complex, my friend, hey, how is it? You know, I'm cool. And there was this kind of currency of cool in the apartment complex there. And that's what I grew up with for about eight years in this particular uh, area as I moved around f through two or three apartment complexes. Um, and these have become kind of um, a series of, in, in some ways, an homage to those kids that were my friends at the time. Kids that in a lot of ways I had to leave behind. And also elegies in some ways to some of them because some of, some of them are no longer around. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> and some of them have led very hard lives since then. But I did want to, uh, so I, I kind of wanted to pay tribute to these guys. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read from this collection is, is uh, called Reasons. Because we knew Tommy's mother had slipped a Percodan at lunch and Brent's father was mixing bourbon and coffee. Because Drake's dad set his ring to leave a mark on his son's ribs. Because Jen's sister humped the maintenance man and Margot's parents prayed at church for the virgin birth and Ellen's stepfather worked third shift while her mother cried alone. Because our clothes were hand-me-downs and bologna was a treat and the two eldest sons of the kings in 4D worked as firemen at Al Allied Chemical. Because we were failing high school French and cigarettes were talismans of things to come as we lay in the clearing in the woods, cherries piping smoke into the air like stacks. Because none of us were virgins and we read club at 10 and sometimes Susie gave us hand jobs behind the dumpster. 
because we knew the local deputy by name and the grave way he shook his head when he put one of us in cuffs, because we carried knives and sometimes fought each other to prove we didn't care, and sometimes stood watch because we did. Because we stole what we needed, candy and records, comic books and booze, pot from a parent's drawer. Because our bikes were the only thing that carried us away from the complex gates into the fields beyond the factory, and we could trust our legs to keep pumping across a creek slicked with oil to a hill where garbage was dumped and where we sat in a perfect row, drinking and watching the sun disappear. Thank you. These next two are kind of related, so I'll introduce them and then just read the two poems. But in South Carolina, they put a, uh, they put a bottle or a pacifier in your hand, and then a couple years later, they take it out of your hand and they stick a gun in it. And um, I, was, I, I, had, I held my first gun when I was about four years old. It was a Derringer, I still remember it. Um, but this is a poem kind of based on that idea um, of remembering my father teaching me how to shoot. It's called Practicing with a 22. I plunked cans and bottles, cradled the stock between my fingers and thumb. My father presses the butt to my shoulder and tells me to line the sights, small stem of steel grooved into the metal V. The trigger is light, and I pull the bullet into existence, powerful as a boy can be. Things become serious when he hangs the silhouette, teaches me to aim for the paper chest or brain. Things become serious as he teaches the variables of wind and distance, caliber and speed, the need to keep the eyes fixed on the target unflinching. Things become serious when he talks of doves falling in puffs of feathers and squirrels' fantastic acrobatics as they drop from trees. He tells me this is practice as he loads the shotgun, places a pumpkin on a stump, I think of faces carved in jack-o'-lanterns, plump hands gripping toy swords, sticky with artificial blood. I think of Halloween masks. He lifts the barrel, leans outward in the same studied way he would slip between storm dorm and frame to place a candy in an open bag. His body lurches, cuts an angry space of sound that seems to, burrow to uh, burrow to the orange center and expand before I even know he's pulled the trigger. The meaty strands and seeds launch into a universe moving outward from the core, covering my hands, sticking to my face. And then this next one is kind of the ultimate result of that training. It's called the Deer Unspoken. She's almost an absence, brown velvet neck muscling the soil. I raise the rifle, place crosshairs on her spine. She's pulsing there in fine electric signals. My heart quickens and something old opens inside me. Midwife to death, it tells me we are one thing breathing along the telescopic sight. I hold my breath and pull the trigger. We are shattered. My closed eyes see nothing, but the skin knows the body is lying in a heap, blood and air rivering the field into blooms of bone and flesh. I take her in the dark, the empty weight stronger than gravity, rooting us to the earth. The sun will rise on a void. The powdered hoof prints, the bed of her body, my boots traveling into nowhere the place where she was loaded and we drove away, a November mysticism, a place where we lifted into air or the field opened up around us, taking this harvest, this bitter cold alchemy back to its beginnings. This next one is about one of my friends in the apartment complex. In fact, he was my best friend at the time, and there's a poem I'm going to close with that's about him too. But just so you know, a, a quick story to give you a sense of the, the, 
kids I call my friends at the time. Um, I got drunk for the first time when I was 11 years old. And I don't mean had a sip of a few things. I mean, a friend of mine named Les Mock and I went uh, over to his house and his mom was out for the night, as so many of the divorced mothers in these complexes were on Friday nights. And we split between us two 11 year old, well, he was actually 13, between two young teenagers, we split, uh, split a fifth of tequila. And the night ended with Les, and I still remember Les, um, this this fire red hair, the face covered in freckles, a severe overbite, and these freakishly long big toes. And I'll tell you, you'll understand why in a minute here, why I remember that detail. Um, because by the end of the night, Les had taken, he had a lever action 22 rifle, and he had taken that rifle and thought it was a fun game to chase me around the house with it. And in a moment when I was able to gather, between my sobbing, but when I was able to gather up enough courage to say, it's not loaded, he made up a point of taking several bullets and loading them into the breach and then working the lever action and then chasing me more around the house and I remember that night and the reason I remember those freakishly long toes is I was on the verge of passing out and I had gotten outside of the apartment and was curled up underneath a bush and I could see those big bare feet with the big freakishly long toes running past the bush looking for me as he continued to try to chase me with the rifle and I woke up later with his mom holding me over a toilet so um, vomiting so those were the people I called my friends <laughs> Um, but this was actually my best friend, and he was a very good friend. Um, his name was Jamon, and this is called Jamon Does a Wheelie. Because you look for, in these places, these beautiful moments, and for me, this is one of those moments. He rides the lines, forearms flexed, holds the wheel above the ground. It's the perfect balance of the thing that makes me want to hold my breath. His feet, feet, uh, his feet feel the shifts of weight and pump the pedals just enough to hold the wheel spinning in air, clipping the day into fragments like quick, quick flip cartoons. He can ride the length of the complex, seated, arms stretched, tireless. He turns to smile because he knows the secrets behind our cheap metal doors, a father's suicide, the girl who deals coke by the pool, as if he can rock the forks and write the sun-fired windows. Jamon, we dream you outdistance us, your narrow profile cutting the road as it absorbs you into things undone, small acts of perfection, your slim body spooling apartments behind you, only the one earthbound wheel, constant as a metronome, while gravity curls the spokes, tries to pull you down. And as a quick follow-up to that, this is another bike poem called The Bike in the Ditch. The wheels were buried to the axle, and poison ivy twined the frame. No one touched it, not even the maintenance men. It testified to transience. Most of us knew waking to a father solemnly leaving with suitcases in hand, the lies parents told to smooth the emptiness. We'd seen the teenager pass on a gurney after huffing gas, face white as bone. He'd been leaving his body, leaving his parents for years. It always stopped what we were doing. A boy running to the ditch to retrieve the baseball would pause and wonder at the tendrils of spoke, the last vestiges of seat stuffing where he could read the movement there he sometimes felt at the edge of sleep when the world slipped out from under him and he woke frantically clutching the sheets. As we grew older, we would sit on the grassy verge and smoke while another family loaded a moving truck with cheap furniture, happy faces going wherever you go when you've used up time in one place. We'd flick the burning butts at the frame, hoping the thing might light, as if we might ignite the rust already forming inside it. Thank you. Skip those two, read three more, and I'm done here. Then I'll have you know, done what John Lennon said of Yoko Ono. I've done my thing all over you. Um, so this poem, I, I then grew up, and when I was in my early 20s, I worked with the Department of Juvenile Justice teaching students who were on parole or probation. Um, and so I kind of got to see some of the kids that were me when I was their age. 
Um, and this is a poem that, about that, in some ways about that recognition. It's called Ezekiel in Art Class. Part one, the class had made the chains of people, hand on paper hand, and now the garbage can was full when Ezekiel pulled one out who'd been ripped away. This my brother Jay, he said, you know, he dead. And then he traced a smile back on his face and eyes as bright as suns. And then in paper, cut out guns. He taped them into place. Now he's safe, he said, I'm gonna take him home. Part two. And on another day, he wrote his name on a paper sheet, rolled it into a scroll to eat, took slow bites and claimed he liked the taste. It's like paste. Then spitting out the moistened wads, he shaped small beings. I thought of God's bitter words, as if Ezekiel might, must chew what the Bible says is true, as if Ezekiel must tell all the children who rebel that they will come to harm, that function follows form. How could I say that he must stay within the lines, that clay is not to throw? What do I know? This is kind of um, a summation of all the people that lived within the apartment complex. I have a series in this collection that deals with kind of circus figures, and this is called Zippo's Circus. We called him Zippo for the silver lighter he'd stolen from his dad. He let us roll the wheel in the dark bathroom to see the flint sparks. And on certain days, he would dazzle us with the trick of pinching the body between the thumb and fingers so it popped open like a chest full of secrets. He sat sometimes at night in a window and let the flame burn while he waited for his mother to come back from the bars, eyes candling the lone hours of morning. No one needed to ask when Building G scorched the tree line, when the wall, wail of sirens announced a boy's circus. We gathered in the parking lot, charred timbers corrupting to smoke and ash, apartments laid open like tinder boxes. We, we clapped when the roof dropped into living room like a trapeze artist falling into a net and laughed at the scrambling firemen because the only clowns we knew had hands of flame and eyes that burned when our mothers told us to go to bed. And the last poem I told you it was gonna come back around to J Jaman, and this is uh, called Seeing Jaman Again, and this is actually when I saw my friend Jaman after about 12 years. Jaman sat next to me at a bar and began to talk. I was three years out of college, and he, having finished two years at the state penitentiary, worked at a, as a line cook at Outback. We didn't speak of stealing, of drinking and fist fights, of long, lazy afternoons of football. We exchange pleasantries the way you must when you've become intimate strangers. He asked me for five dollars, and I paid my indulgence, climbed into my truck, and drove somewhere into the future. We grieve in small ways. A song on the radio, a sip of beer, and then one day, some unforetold resurrection. My son rides his bicycle down the driveway, lifts the front wheel, urges it through the air with his pedals, and the sun's glimmer on the spokes makes the briefest angel on the street. Thank you.